That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Bullet Train, the fifth film and fourth solo effort directed by David Leach, uh, which Sony Pictures releasing uh, will be making available to the general public on August 5th, 2022. What else has David done? Well, he co-directed 2014's John Wick, which created a whole new franchise alongside Chad Stahelski. Mr. Stahelski has continued in the John Wick films on his own, and David Leach has uh, branched out with things like Deadpool 2 and Fast and the Furious Hobbs and Shaw, and uh, one film of his that I did really like was Atomic Blonde, starring Charlize Theron. Theron. Well, where to begin? I don't have any notes. It's based on a 2010 novel by Kataro Isaka. Okay. Uh, it's his uh, first adaptation of it. It's a notable uh, mystery writer, uh, first English language adaptation. I was laughing earlier because the English language translation of the title of the book is Maria Beetle. Hmm. I was going to say I don't have any notes, which is usually a sign that nothing stood out to me. Uh, the film feels pretty one note. It, it is. It, it felt mm -hmm. kind of long. It's a little over two hours. Mm -hmm. It felt like a three-hour movie to me. Because it's just these people on a train getting to a destination. And just consistent fighting. Uh, it does give me, like, John Wick vibes. Yes. Uh, so there's it's, that. It's very stylized. It's hyper-stylized. So if, it looks really cool. If you like uh, Leech's... Uh fight choreography that is on full display and you know maybe arguably are some of the film's best moments the dialogue is very specific and cheeky it's hammy which became tedious i think brad pitt is i think brad best pitt, utilized yes i think he's actually kind of sweet and cute for the most part but even his shtick by the final act does get a little Okay, and then the basic story, the plot is not complicated, but there's a lot going on for something that amounts to being very superficial, I think. But, okay, I'm going to try. What? I was going to say, you can start by saying there are five assassins, technically, that are vying for the same thing. Okay. And then branch out into the subplots. Well, how I was going to describe it is Michael Shannon plays a character named the White Death. And he's the leader of this Japanese organized crime syndicate, like the Yakuza. Which is a term they never use in this film. But but it's important to know that he gained his power by overthrowing the previous per leader. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Michael Shannon's wife, we found out, was killed in an assassination attempt against him. So now he wants revenge against the people responsible for her death, as well as the people who could have helped protect her. So he's just mad at everybody. So what? And that is like a major spoiler because that you, that's not revealed to us until the last like 15, 20 minutes of the film. <laughs> well, it's the only way to explain it, I feel. Sure. So in order to get revenge, he gets all of these people on the same bullet train headed to Kyoto. From Tokyo. So those people are... Aaron Taylor Johnson and Brian Tyree Henry, they play two like brothers named Lemon and Tangerine. Mm -hmm. They're like contract killers. We also live in a world kind of like John Wick where there's this global network of people who are like secret agents but not government related. I don't know. Um, so it's those two. It's Zazie Beats. As the Hornet. As the Hornet. It's Brad Pitt. But the gag is Brad Pitt, he's representing a different assassin who called out sick that day. <laughs> so Brad Pitt, like, takes the job at the last minute. For a snatch and grab. For a snatch and grab. But the White Death is thinking that Brad Pitt is a different assassin. Then we have... Okay, so then it's those four people. But then we have some other characters, like someone called The Prince... Played by... Joey King. Who we find out is the White Death's daughter. Mm -hmm. And then to add another layer of complexity to this thing, she wants to kill her dad, Michael Shannon, because he wasn't a good father to her. Like, he ignored her. She also kind of wants to prove himself because her brother is being transported. Her brother's on the train being transported by Lemon and Tangerine. And the brother's played by Logan Lerman. But that's all a ruse to get these two fools on the train. Mm -hmm. But... Joey King, 
Oh my goodness. The reason I brought up the fact that Michael Shannon overthrew the previous leader is because there's this other man who used to work for the previous leader, played by... Hiroyuki Sonata. He's been in quite a few things we've reviewed. Joey King pushes that man's grandson off of a building. Mm -hmm. So she pushed this little boy off of a building. Now he's in the hospital. Knowing that that man would want to exact revenge on the white death. So she did that to lure him and the little boy's son onto the train to like manipulate them into killing her dad. <laughs> so we have, and then Bad Bunny plays a character named the Wolf, mm -hmm. who's trying to get revenge on the person who killed his family in Mexico, who happened to be Zazie Beats, and she's doing that because there's some like super venomous snake, the Boon Sling. Is that what it's called? I think so. The Boon Sling. That snake's venom causes people's um, organs to liquefy and then they shoot out of people's like orifices. So we see characters bleeding blood from their eyes and vomiting blood. So for some reason we needed the wolf on this train who has nothing to do with Michael Shannon, but he wants to get Zazie Beats. What he serves is Brad Pitt's only supposed to be on there for one stop and he's continu continually thwarted on the five or so stops to Kyoto and Bad yes. Bunny is the first person to stop him. From yes, him. and it's also important to know Brad Pitt's character uh, says he's like, uh, like suffers from bad luck mm -hmm. and we also see that he took a leave of absence from his job as an assassin for stress management and that now he's all like he's practicing like zen and trying to just be a better person he's reevaluating his priorities which is cute i, I think it, it works well for him for the most part mm -hmm. by the last like half hour it does get boring especially because his boss brad pitt's boss is played by Sandra Bullock. Maria. And we hear her on the phone talking to him. And I didn't think that worked well. Because no. she's very dry. And that humor gets becomes tedious. And she does make an appearance at the end, which we can get to. But yeah, all these people are interconnected. And they're on this train for an hour, 45 minutes. Um, just fighting each other. Not really understanding that it's all a setup for the white death to kill them all. And we're waiting for the film to explain it all for us as it, as it does. But uh, yeah, I told the film in reverse, so I spoiled it and <clears throat> went in reverse. And but. until then, I think the humor is really off in this film. It's re it feels really broad and sometimes even adolescent. And I don't know if that was the, the screenwriter was Zach Olkowitz, uh, whose previous credit was uh, fear street part two, 1978. Uh, but uh, yeah, most of that doesn't work. I think Brad Pitt is able to overcome a lot of that with... Uh, I, I think he has a sense of this character. Everybody else feels like they're trying really hard. Okay, so what did I like? The movie looks really cool. The fight choreography is very well done. Brad Pitt's really cute in the movie. What didn't I like? I think the plot is overly complex. I think... You like think? you mentioned, some of these... So if the actors aren't being like cheeky, then it seems like they're trying very hard. Namely, the dad of the boy who was pushed, mm -hmm. who has like very like a very emo look, and what, what? Uh, Kimura played by Andrew Koji. He's a handsome man, but mm -hmm. he looked like every scene he was about to start crying and yelling at the same time. Mm -hmm. He just that seemed real in stark contrast because for the bulk of the film, he's paired with. Joey King's character, who I could not stand. I think she's miscast. <laughs> oh, I could not stand that girl. For what? Because for someone essentially who has like daddy issues, I wanted her to be more like aggressive in the sense that like she's had to protect herself because her father wasn't there for her. But instead, this character, every time she gets into a pinch, she does this thing where I'm like, I'm just a little girl. I'm innocent. I don't know what's going on. Oh, I hated it. And I hated her face. Just everything about that character. She looked, I hated. Yeah, she looked like a little Cupid doll. Uh, and then, but she's paired with the the guy who looks like the crow. Yes, and then I I I also strongly disliked the reveal that she's the daughter of this this Russian mobster. And when she's speaking Russian with Michael Shannon, who is outfitted like the vampire Lestat with that hair. <laughs> When we first realized, because it's a gag as to who the White Death is. Because for the bulk of the film, we get visions of him killing the previous leader. And he's shirtless and muscular with tattoos and badass because he's wearing a mask. And then when we finally see it's Michael Shannon, I was giggling. Mm -hmm. 
And then, yeah, his hair looks like something out of, like, Harry Potter. And you know what else is interesting? I was struck by this whole thing about luck and fate that's going on with the characters that they're, they're hitting us over the head with. But jo the Joey King character is like, oh, it's because I'm lucky and my luck is rubbing off on you. That is the same storyline given to the Zazie Beats character in Deadpool 2. Yes. So, yeah, everything feels a little derivative. I, I like Aaron Taylor Johnson, like, on screen, but I feel like he has nothing to do but be British and cheeky and... It, this also feels very much like a Guy Ritchie ripoff, that kind of energy and vibe. And, and then his relationship with his brother, Brian Tyree Henry, which is played... I don't like when they do obvious, like, obviously this white British... Like, this white man and this black man are not, like, biological brothers. So then, as the audience, we're like, oh, they must either be adopted or grew up together. So it's like... I don't see why make it a gag. And, and especially to give them this, there's, I, I think they're trying for some level of poignancy by giving them this Romeo and Juliet kind of romance where they think that, we, we think that uh, Brian Tyree Henry is dead at first and he's not. And then uh, in that interim, Tangerine gets killed and then they have this whole double mourning process with, you know, cheeky soundtrack selections and... I don't know. It, you feel nothing. I don't feel anything for any of these people, which is part that of the problem. Being, yeah, I agree. That being said, some of the people I watch on YouTube, I'm assuming they're going to say this is like the best movie of the year. So I can see people liking it. It's just very familiar. I almost wish that the film would have had the tone of John Wick, where everyone played straight except Brad Pitt. Who's, you know, stoic throughout. Who is like just this guy who has bad luck, but he's also an assassin and he's trying to like, you know, be Zen, but then he's in this ultra violent space. I think that would have worked better. But the fact that every character is doing a bit, it was just, it oh, made the film feel really long. You know, I thought Brian Tyree Henry looked a little crazy with that, that hair. hair. Yeah. He and looked like a spot. <laughs> he looked like a. Uh, my Nubian twist sponge if you dipped it in lotion. <laughs> I was going to say something like they're trying to make the Fredless, Frederick Douglass hairdo look chic, but... Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I hated his Thomas the, the Truck, the Thomas the Tank. Uh, oh, that's right. That's his character's, like, personality is that he grew up on Thomas the Tank and no. he, he is good at reading people by saying which character they are. You know, again, that would have been good if that were, like, the main character's sort of thing... But as a side character, like that being repeated over and over again, I don't know. I, again, it's a well-crafted movie. It looks cool. It's well-performed as far as the action goes. Uh, yeah, Leach is using his usual uh, cinematographer, Jonathan Sella, uh, who also lends The Lost City, which uh, paired Brad Pitt and Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum, the co-star of that oh, film. Oh, Channing Tatum's in this movie... Uh, playing like a tourist who is supposed to be gay mm -hmm. and Brad Pitt approaches him initially propositioning him to like take his like hat but then Channing Tatum thinks like oh he wants to have sex with him mm -hmm. and then it's clear that his character later on thinks Aaron Taylor Johnson is sexy so that was like okay Channing Tatum's played that kind of character before in a movie mm -hmm. and then Ryan Reynolds makes an appearance as another ass oh the assassin who the white death really wants to get mm -hmm. is someone called Garver, I Car think. Carver. Carver. And that's Ryan Reynolds. Mm -hmm. But Ryan Reynolds called out sick and that's why Brad Pitt's on the train. So, yeah, there's a lot of star power. Again, I can see people really thinking this movie is the best and fucking hilarious. For me, it was... Yeah, I think it's okay. If I would have paid to see it, I, don't, I wouldn't be mad, but I would have been... I was a little tired by the end. This narrative is as straight and uh, unwavering as the train track itself. There, there are no highs and lows. It, it's uh, it, for a, for over two hours, and then all of the moments of uh, that hyperkinetic humor, like we get the vantage point of a water bottle at one point that is used to hit somebody in the head that kills them. The, uh, it just it just feels like this is too long. I don't need this. Um, you know, it feels very much like uh, uh, roided out Agatha Christie, like this could be murders on the Tokyo yes. Express. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I kept thinking of other train movies I wanted to watch after this that I had have better memories of, like the remake of Narrow Margin from 1990 and kind of uh, with Gene Hackman on the top of that train. Like, th it made me want to watch all these other things rather than continue watching this. And then yeah. Sandra Bullock makes an appearance. Oh, yeah. That lady looks crazy. I thought she looked like that lady from Planet of the Apes. Oh, my God. Which one? Uh, Kim Hunter or Helena Bonham Carter? Which version? 
Or that Muppet thing from the Black Crystal or... The Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal or... <laughs> Kira from the Dark Crystal. She had a yeah. look that was like that of a mannequin come to life. Well, she has on that like makeup, like the HD that blurs the skin. So already the texture of her face looks weird in the movie. And then she has a mullet haircut. And then just her appearance at the end, which is supposed to be, I guess, a gag just sort of had no impact we hear her on the phone and then she shows up in this fancy car and then brad pitt's talking about his bad luck but maybe his luck has turned around and then a light pole falls on her fancy new car i, I whatever and joey king in, in, in kind of mid credits gets taken out by brian tyree henry in a tangerine a, a truck carrying tangerines which is his dead brother's name Anyway, what would you give this movie? Two and a half. I would give it two and a half. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.